are now getting into the third session entitled uh, Deep Tech Training Transformation Scheme, IPR Strategies for Innovation. My name is uh, Professor Luke Mumba, and uh, I'm the immediate past vice chancellor of the University of Zambia. My areas are genetics, biotechnology, STI measurements and monitoring and evaluation. I'm currently a private consultant affiliated to the University of Pretoria uh, Enterprises. It is a pleasure to be one of the co-chairs uh, for this uh, uh, session. I'm sitting in for Dr. Rachel Chikwamba, who unfortunately, uh, for circumstances beyond our control, could not be with us. At this juncture, allow me to hand over to my co-chair. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Mumba. Again, also from my side, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Medico Litz. I'm a professor of biochemistry at the University of East Piedmont in Italy. I'm currently a member of the governing board, the National Italian Agency for University and Research Assessment. Um, for the sake of time, of course, I will just um, um, again welcome everybody and go directly to court on the stage, on the virtual stage, the first speaker, uh, which is Professor Pat Gramsci from the African Pharmaceutical Technology Foundation, uh, which uh, is supposed to be the first speaker of our session. So I don't know if um, Professor um, Pat Gramsci is already connected, and if so, please just go ahead with your presentation. Overall is uh, 13 minutes plus two minutes questions, so I will take the freedom to maybe uh, let you know when one minute is left from, from your time. Please, the stage is all yours. Thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be in this meeting today. Um, I want to thank the two co-chairs um, for, uh, for the invitation, apart from the organizers. Um, I will um, share my screen. So I'm going to talk to the topic of this session, give you a little bit of a background about um, what the African Pharmaceutical Technology Foundation is and uh, what we do. Um, to begin with, um, the African Pharmaceutical Technology Foundation is a new uh, regional agency in Africa, which has been uh, created by the African Development Bank at the request of the African Union member states to change the technology environment in Africa. In Africa, we are far reaching issues for access to medicines and we are nowhere near the solution. Uh, COVID-19 has brought a lot of focus on vaccines, which are mostly sourced from outside the region. We know now that 90% or more of the volume of vaccines is facilitated through the Gavi UNICEF procurement mechanism. This means that there is only about 150 million doses of vaccines that are not Gavi eligible in Africa and uh, the rest is actually supported from the Gavi eligibility process. But this situation is likely to change in Africa because seven countries and particularly seven large countries are expected to transition out of Gavi support over the next five years. This will change the market for vaccines in Africa, leading it to a private market of more than 320 million doses. And this transition of many countries from within Gavi support to outside Gavi support is going to continue by, by over the years. So by 2035, we'll have more than half of the African market, which is not Gavi supported, making it a very prime market for domestic production. The same thing is true already of procured medicines. So although more than 90% of procured medicines are sourced from Global Fund, PEPFAR, or CHAI, these are restricted to a few medical categories only. These are restricted to malaria, tuberculosis, HIV, AIDS, and so on. And there's wide varieties of, uh, of drugs and medical products for which we don't have actually access in Africa. This includes insulin. Where our, in 24 countries, there was no insulin found to be registered at all in 2021, according to a global study, and most of these are in Africa. 
But we also have other kinds of problems for viral and rare diseases. We have low information for oncology and other modern products. We have low availability, high prices, late introductions, although the uh, burden of non-communicable diseases is on rise. And even in common non-infectious disease conditions, we don't have enough medical services, we don't have medical products, and we have a lack of data. So during COVID-19, what we saw in the region is actually three kinds of operations. One, we saw a crisis stage operations, what we call, which is really, uh, you know, um, African Union and Africa CDC called for international partnerships to build Africa's capacity. This led to a number of initiatives like the mRNA hub and also to uh, international investments in many partnerships. And these things are focused mainly on trying to produce uh, vaccines for manufacturer of fill and finish. And a very small share of these current initiatives are about drug substance. And R&D and cutting edge technologies are not on the radar. And most of the stuff which is going on for drugs, once again, is about chemistry based traditional manufacturing. To really build the pharmaceutical sector in Africa, we need to actually also think about how are we going to sustain an innovation ecosystem where we build along this value pyramid and move from fill and finish to value added, to new technologies, to data generation techniques, to making technology partnerships happen in these new product and therapeutic categories, and to enhance focus on stronger R&D capacity for both conventional technologies and new technologies with a clear focus on pandemic preparedness, of course, but also regional security and epidemic profile of the African region. And now COVID-19 also exemplified that the lack of capacity should not be built at the time of crisis, but it needs to be built before a time of crisis, because at that time, that lack of capacity prevented effective and timely allocation, of course, right? But the lack of capacity also excluded Africa's public and private sectors from getting into production agreements and from R&D. And this kind of situation that we had, we don't want to have it the next time around. So the African Pharmaceutical Technology Foundation's vision is the true public health value chain vision. So what we do is we work across the entire value chain of production where technology is critical. Technology is critical right from the time you construct a plant. It's critical for the plant design. It's critical actually to do basic production. It's critical to streamline that production. It's critical for GMP upgrading. It's critical for knowledge access to expand on products. It's critical to move up the value chain. And in all these aspects, we come in to do knowledge access by providing strategic support for new technologies to provide search and transacting access with partners by providing negotiation support. Then we come in for technology transfer and skills development, where we try to do knowledge transfer support. And here our focus is not just on licensing and sub-licensing, but really looking at tacit know-how sharing, R&D ecosystem building, and how to match skills with the production capacity and innovation capacity that's being planned at the firm level and institute level, and how do we enhance labor mobility and exchange of ideas and collaborative systems. Then we also support production. We help companies to scale up support by co-financing and engaging in capacity development. And we also do R&D ecosystem building across Africa by championing new regional and sub-regional programs to rebuild public R&D capacity, which is the backbone of any good life sciences production and innovation ecosystem. Our overall objective is to change the technology environment in Africa, and we do that by intervening at the firm level, at the sector level, and at the regional level. And at the firm level, we tackle issues of search capacity, help firms to choose production pipeline and establish collaborations. We help them to diversify their product pipelines to reduce risks. At the sector level, we do value chain building. We don't do it just for the pharmaceutical sector, for the end products, we do it for all inputs that go in to reduce the cost of goods. We identify critical entry points for new companies and new products and R&D system rebuilding. At the regional level, we coordinate critical sectoral infrastructure. 
and we work towards new impact-driven models of change. And we also help to synergize country initiatives and leverage coordination and complementarity. Our operational areas are threefold. We facilitate doing a range of technology assistance activities. We broker technology as co-financers and help firms and institutes to upgrade. And we do impact investing at the region. We build critical regional infrastructure that is needed in Africa for the pharmaceutical sector to emerge as an active and thriving sector. In all cases, our main targets are African companies, African public sector institutions, African governments, African industry associations. But we also liaise with foreign companies, foreign institutions, development partners, and foreign uh, universities to actually promote these kinds of collaborative partnerships. We work with a range of partners. I'm not going to waste anyone's time by going into this. I just want to end my presentation by talking about a few upcoming events. A key event that might be of interest to this group is the International Conference on Innovation and Technology Transfer in Africa's pharmaceutical sector that's going to take place on the 5th and 6th of February. The other events is we are going to have a joint private sector workshop on market creation for African vaccines in Feb. We are doing UNDP training series for African policymakers on innovation policy for Africa's pharmaceutical sector, both in February and June. And we are hosting an African pharmaceutical technology marketplace in April of next year. If you're interested in these events, please consult our website. This is my last slide on our conference. In this conference, the core thematic areas um, are really to, to look at technology and innovation capacity in Africa's pharmaceutical sector, particularly vaccine, both public and private, to look at global and domestic enforcement of intellectual property rights and the issues that they create for market development, both opportunities and challenges in Africa, to look at innovative financing models to develop Africa's vaccine R&D ecosystem, to have new development-centered approaches to build Africa's do domestic vaccine ecosystem, and then to look at best practice studies and normative frameworks for technology transfer in the vaccine sector and how they are applicable for Africa, and regulatory issues in Africa, including market shaping, pool procurement, and trade incentives for Africa's pharmaceutical sector. I thank you very much for your time and the opportunity to present the African Pharmaceutical Technology Foundation, and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much. I mean, you, you kept the time perfectly and very insightful and informative um, uh, uh, talk. So, of course, we have time for one, two questions. Uh, please, if you have any question, put it on the chat. I see the first one, so I'm going to read it. Um, so, um, regarding enabling the ecosystem, there are many reports addressing the lack of full use of TRIPS flexibilities in Africa. Are there any initiatives targeted to this? Initiatives targeted to this? Yes, absolutely. We have a program on uh, TRIPS flexibilities and their implementation in Africa, which we're actually launching early next year. And um, this is actually a very good question because a number of African countries have not really fully enforced TRIPS flexibilities. There is also a lack of awareness <coughs> of what flexibilities are really useful for local production and innovation. So our program is going to target that. Thank you very much. We still have one minute. If there is no other question, I do have one actually, but let's wait a couple of seconds if there is any from the audience. So I, I I will then take freedom to ask you a question and which is uh, relating. Let's forget about vaccines and let's uh, focusing on other medicine, in particular oncology. Do you think that you know having a strong program on production of biosimilar of monoclonal antibodies for just to give an example and let, let's talk about breast cancer tosuzumab, which is one of the monoclonal antibody in the essential list, but still not really available in Africa. Be a priority. Oh yeah, it's a priority for our foundation. So we have we have a program on biosimilars development in Africa that we are launching with the European Investment Bank, and it's a definite priority for us. Thank you very much. It's a very very good news because yeah, that that's equally important. One always focus on neglected diseases, but I mean priorities are 
really linked to many other, as you mentioned. Um, I think we we are running out of time. Maybe very quick last question again from Leonidas. Um, uh, says, on the other hand, some activities regarding licensing seems very much aligned to MPP work. Is this the same business model for APTF? How is the interaction with such licensing pools between APTF and MPP? If you can briefly answer this question, then we can pass on the second speaker. Thank you very much again for your talk. Thank you. Yeah, MPP is doing voluntary licensing at the global level. Until now, of all the licenses that have been issued by MPP, there have been very few African companies that have received sub licenses. A reason for this is that GMP compliance is a core prerequisite actually to benefit from licenses in the MPP. What we do is somehow different because we try to bring firms up to speed because to get those licenses, there's a long way to go and there's a lot of technology work to do. Secondly, in addition to the licenses, we also provide tacit know-how support and other kinds of plant level support, which MPP doesn't do. And we co-finance all these activities, which also MPP doesn't do. And we focus mainly on Africa and for the licensing work, we will collaborate with MPP to the extent possible. So thank you very much. I think we started one minute past one, so we exactly cover the 15 minutes. Thank you very much again uh, for your talk and contribution. I will pass it to my colleague, uh, Professor Mombaluke, to introduce the second speaker. Thank you very much again. It was a pleasure. Um, Laura Mgazzini from uh, Santana School of Advanced Studies in Pisa. So my idea I'm presenting. Okay, so thank you for inviting us to present this work. This is a study about uh, improving access to medicine and uh, promoting pharmaceutical innovation that I draft with uh, Simona Gamba at the University of Milan and Paolo Pertile at the University of Verona in Italy. And the study was prepared for uh, uh, the Panel for Future of Science and Technology, which is a scientific unit at the European Parliament. And, uh, and we started from the premise that health is a fundamental right, as also stated by the Declaration of Human Rights and Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations. And to achieve equality in access to medicine, we uh, need true conditions. First, innovation is needed. That is, uh, to have new products that are more effective than the existing treatment. And uh, access needs to be granted to patients, both in terms of affordability and availability. In the current framework, it is challenging to find a balance between uh, these two conditions uh, because the um, current framework is mainly based on patents and regulatory exclusivity for pharmaceuticals to stimulate private investments and is struggle to find a balance between uh, access and innovation. Indeed, exclusivity provides an incentive to invest only in some clinical areas, since uh, the size of the market, uh, the size of the results is linked to the size of the market, and so it's less likely to have innovation in areas that are characterized by small expected results, even when they may have a higher value to society. On the other side, access is not always granted, and the uh, high price for new drugs may emerge even in the presence of public investments. Against this background, the study has evaluated the impact of different tools of innovation and access. Our focus was on the uh, European countries and we took into account different uh, provisions spanning from patents and supplementary patent protection to um, the um, tools that are specifically targeted for protecting uh, new pharmaceuticals. As a, novel, uh, as a novelty to the discussion, we also analyze the role of public-oriented approaches. And uh, actually, the, the study is quite broad. And in this, uh, um, this presentation, I will just focus on uh, um, provision, on a subset of provision that has been analyzed. The report uh, is based on an extensive literature review involving more than uh, 200 different sources and uh, structure and interview, semi structured interview with expert stakeholders involving uh, pharma and patients representatives, researchers and clinicians, as well as public health experts and uh, 
public officers. The questions uh, provided in the questionnaire, we discussed about hurdles to innovation, focusing on the area of antimicrobial care diseases and pediatric disease, the role of incentive across three main dimensions, that is the stimulus to innovation, both in general and specific for unmet needs, the access dimension and the predictability for uh, generic companies and competitors. And uh, we also ask for proposal of alternative framework that may be implemented to better strike the balance between the three objectives that I mentioned. And we also ask for comments on uh, the proposal that is currently discussed at uh, uh, the European Parliament. In this and the next slide, I'm going to uh, provide a summary of the results that are bo based both on uh, the literature reviews and uh, on uh, round interviews. These slides focus on uh, the effect of exclusivities. And uh, in this context, the literature is wide since these incentives have been widely adopted. Exclusivity have an overall positive effect on innovation, but uh, they have limited role in directing R&D towards areas with small market size. There are also issues related to uh, access because of prices that may emerge due to limited competition in, uh, uh, in, some, uh, in some areas. Also, uh, the effect on predictability is negative because there might be um, strategic behavior on, uh, on the firm side or uh, there might be uh, heterogeneity uh, across countries due to uh, difference in uh, the provision of supplementary patient protection at the country level. Then we also take into account uh, the linkage models and particularly we discussed about transferable exclusivity voucher and subscription model where trans transferable exclusivity vouchers are currently discussed in the proposal for the new EU pharmaceutical registration and uh, they would provide an extension of exclusivity provision on a product at the choice of the owner or they can be sold. Uh, so they have a potentially positive effect of innovation and uh, differently from exclusivity due to the fact that actually rewards are decoupled from the value of innovation, they also have the ability to direct R&D towards unmet medical needs. Concerning access, since the voucher can be used on any product, the impact is going to be on the market where the, the voucher is used rather than on the market where uh, the innovation was, uh, was done. The transferable exclusivity voucher are a novelty in the international, uh, um, the international arena, but they are, can be expected to uh, be risky because their cost is going to be unknown in advance uh, and it can be uh, high. On the contrary, uh, subscription model, uh, also in this case, uh, they are expected to have a positive effect uh, on uh, uh, directed on uh, innovation directed to unmet medical need uh, because of uh, the, the linkage with uh, uh, the market size, but uh, there is limited evidence overall on their ability to uh, foster innovation in general. There are some drawbacks uh, that are uh, related to the need of uh, identify ex ante the criteria for receiving the incentive. This can be sometimes difficult with uh, innovation. The difficult, uh, difficulty in setting the value of the reward ex ante and uh, the need of, of upfront payment and coordination among uh, member states. We also consider in the report uh, the um, alternative framework that involve public-oriented approaches, and uh, we can expect positive effect on all the dimensions that uh, have been considered because of dedicated effort or lack of profit objective on, uh, in, this, in this framework. However, there are, of course, disadvantages that are mostly related to coordination issue within uh, uh, the European framework, and also in the terms of the public R&D infrastructure, would require a long-term implementation and large upfront payment uh, from, uh, from the public, public sector. So given these results, uh, based on the literature review uh, uh, and the interviews, in the study we propose uh, 
uh, five policy option uh, that we compare with the current regulatory framework, uh, which is, as mentioned before, the current regulatory framework mainly relies on exclusivity to stimulate private investments, also in the case of unmet medical needs. And uh, in this framework, uh, we have that members, single member states in the European context are responsible for pricing and reimbursement decision. This has, of course, some advantages, but also exhibits some issue. And uh, among the advantages, let me mention the fact that the risk of overinvestment in projects with limited likelihood to reach the patients is reduced. And these kinds of provisions are quite easy to, to be applied, not requiring, again, coordination among the different states. However, there is evidence of lack of clarity, uncertainty, and disparities in access also among the member states and therapeutic areas that remain unexplored. So in the following, I, ref I will refer to part of the policy option that may be useful to address some of these issues. The next one, we suggest strengthening the EU coordination, both in IPR and, uh, and procurement. And uh, joint procurement uh, would allow for the creation of uh, European uh, price, uh, which, uh, which should be defined in a transparent way. Member states should be given the possibility to opt out of joint procurement, as it is also the case uh, under the Joint Procurement Act. And uh, of course, this option uh, would require a significant in initial investment and reaching a, bron a, bo uh, a broad consensus sorry, among the member states. Uh, however, we believe that industry could enhance efficiency with a reduction in costs associated with national market access procedure, and also payers may benefit from uh, wider availability. We also um, propose a redesigning of the incentive, and here let me just mention that uh, we propose to uh, strictly focus on patient and supplementary patient protection, and to introduce uh, su subscription models to further foster the innovation effort in uh, specific areas that are characterized by uh, limited innovation efforts on the side of, of the industry, particularly ultra rare diseases and the case of uh, antimicrobial. And uh, we finally propose the setting up of European infrastructure for pharmaceutical R&D to foster the role of the pub public sector in those areas that are uh, in which the uh, private sector is under investing relative uh, to public health needs, such as uh, a met medical needs in the case of, uh, of emergency. We would prefer a comprehensive approach that uh, the most ambitious uh, uh, policy option would include a comprehensive approach, uh, which uh, uh, would take into account the three um, suggestions that I've uh, introduced before, and uh, this would include uh, the advantages that were mentioned before, uh, and uh, would uh, also allow the exploitation of synergies. Okay, so let me conclude telling that there are several issues that characterize the pharmaceutical sector and, uh, and its regulation, particularly in striking the balance between innovation on one side and access on the other. And uh, so a reform is required. And uh, in, uh, in the study, we have tried to make some proposal that uh, actually might address some of uh, the issues that have been, uh, have been highlighted. Thank you. Um, maybe I'll allow one question, one quick question. What are the critical tools in the EU framework that should not be implemented in African countries? Now, I think that, I mean, uh, rather than saying what should not be implemented, I would like uh, to focus on two things that I think are, uh, are important. On the one side, try to get coordination whenever, anytime, anytime is possible. And, uh, also, uh, do try to uh, fix priorities and uh, try, try to drive uh, 
private investments towards the areas that are going to be uh, most uh, uh, most important for uh, for the country. So we move to the next uh, speaker. There, there have been a change in the program. So uh, Mrs. Mason Gum will be the last presenter. So now it's time to introduce. Uh, three speakers uh, talking about open science and IPR related issues. The first one is Dr. Costa Glinus, which I invite uh, for his presentation. Uh, so the floor is all yours, is eight minutes plus two questions. Thank you very much for accepting, please. So uh, I will introduce a quite a different uh, topic, but a different topic that uh, is, I think, I believe, uh, quite related to uh, intellectual property rights. It concerns the way you do research and uh, the uh, especially the way you do research and innovation and technology development in uh, the academic environment or in the universities and research centers uh, around the world and this is open science so my name is Kostas Glinos I'm an independent expert I have been working for the European Commission in uh, uh, policy making in the area of research and innovation for uh, many years so a definition first of all what is open science it's simple open science is a way of doing science whereby knowledge is being shared and knowledge means not just um, reports and papers but also data and algorithms and tools and models so everything that it is uh, an output of the research process and uh, so this connects also to the um, knowledge access that was mentioned by the previous speakers uh, and this sharing takes place as early as possible in the research process uh, the um, not in a year or two years but as soon as this is feasible and this happens also in open collaboration with all the relevant knowledge actors what does open science require from experience in the last 20 years in uh, many countries around the world, including in the European Union, requires an appropriate policy framework. Sometimes it requires also a legislative modification, a legislative uh, framework. Uh, this is the case now uh, in most European countries. Most countries have policies on open science uh, and open science, including uh, open access, data management, uh, communications, uh, citizen science uh, and so on but also this happens now increasingly in Africa especially after the uh, UNESCO recommendation of uh, last year of uh, sorry of uh, uh, two years ago uh, we have for example uh, Botswana and Ethiopia that have already published their open science policies uh, there is Ghana that it is uh, working on uh, on one as part of its national science policy I know about uh, other countries uh, like uh, Ivory Coast or Sierra Leone that are also contemplating uh, open science policies at the, at the national level. Uh, it also requires deploying the supporting infrastructures. Most research today is supported by digital means. Sharing its results requires digital uh, technologies and therefore infrastructures for communication, uh, for data, uh, for data management, for uh, repositories, for computing, uh, data analytics, uh, but also infrastructures for publishing uh, are uh, necessary in order to practice open science effectively. And this is in progress also in Africa. It's already more than 10 years, for example, that the Africa Connect uh, project that connects uh, African countries between themselves and to internet backbones to achieve very high speed connectivity in African research centers and universities has already been kicked off and is in progress. And thirdly, and most importantly, of course, is that it requires adoption by the practitioners. So the open science practices need to be adopted by the research performers themselves, for the, by the individuals, by the universities, and to do this, besides the infrastructures and the policies, it also requires an appropriate set of incentives and rewards so that people see the meaning and have an incentive to uh, practice uh, open science. So I would like to deliver three messages today. Uh, first, that openness is essential for both science and innovation. Secondly, that 
there is no contradiction between uh, protecting knowledge and open science. This can be compatible and can even be synergetic. And that the uh, adoption really of open science requires a cultural shift because it requires to reform what we consider as high quality, excellent research. So it requires reforming the way we assess research and researchers. So on the first one, why, why do we care? Why do we care about open science? It increases the quality and efficiency of research and innovation. And if you have high quality uh, research, it means that you have trust by the public, by the citizens in science. Do, don't we have trust? Well, look at what was the case with COVID. Uh, what is the case with climate change? To take some of the most uh, popular uh, recent examples, there is a significant, there are significant parts of the populations in all kinds around the world that are very skeptical about, uh, for example, the uh, what scientists and scientific committees have been advocated about COVID, for instance. Let me give you an example of this, or a negative example, uh, which is reproducibility. So high quality science, among other things, uh, means results that can be reproduced. In other words, uh, let's say you have a scientific publication, its conclusions should be verifiable. Otherwise, they cannot be trusted. And uh, there have been uh, many studies over the last 10 years. The, uh, and I take the example here from the health area, since this is of significant, of significant interest in Africa. We are spending roughly 300 billion a year for health research worldwide. But there are many people who argue uh, that up to 85% of this, and this is frightening, uh, is not reproducible. It's not, in other words, is not to be trusted. And the reasons for this are many. Uh, some of them, or most of them, actually relate to the way you do carry out the science, to the extent and to the extent to which you share the results. For example, <clears throat> if you have conclusions in a paper, but you do not have access to the software or the codes or the data that produce these conclusions, then you cannot verify the results. And therefore, it is difficult to trust them. Uh, the results may not be uh, fully accessible. Many of the results are not published. We are not, unfortunately, publishing negative results. So, uh, for example, in clinical trials. This is, uh, uh, therefore, uh, reproducibility is essential to uh, increase the quality of research and the trustability of the results. But open science uh, results in more innovation also. And it results more innovation, including by enabling more risk taking. And this is, these are some uh, very interesting results from a few years ago, where it shows that actually we're publishing more and more papers, but we are not producing as much impact as we would expect. We're not producing as much innovation. Uh, the, uh, since again, we're talking about health, the case of cancer is very instructive there on the table that actually if you uh, see per public per hundred publications or per clinical trial the number of life lives saved uh, out of cancer innovations are going down rather than up so my second uh, uh, my second uh, uh, message was that ipr and open science are compatible i'm not going to say much about this because uh, there are reports both the european union and unesco that are resolving, I think, this, and uh, I have put an excerpt there from uh, the uh, UNESCO report. But just as an example, uh, data can be protected and open, or can be protected and closed, or can be unprotected and closed, or unprotected and open. So the, 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 uh, the two things, protecting knowledge, uh, is uh, not contradictory to having uh, to an open science policy, uh, on the contrary. And my final uh, message is that if we want to make these transformations, then we need to reform the way science is being assessed and Africa that can be leading uh, in the uh, participating and eventually leading leapfrogging the rest of the world by defining excellence, not 
on the basis of how many publications one did or where these were published, but on the basis of the actual impacts that uh, the uh, researcher or the research institution had and rewarding teamwork, collaboration and openness. This, there is an initiative in Europe. Some of you are, know very well about it. Uh, and uh, this is, uh, there is a coalition called COARA and this was uh, launched last year. It was warmly um, received. Uh, you see here the uh, one editorial from Nature. And I think that African institutions, especially public institutions, should also be participating in such initiatives. Thank you. Thank you, Kosa, very much. I think for the sake of time, we, we might want to move on the second uh, couple of speakers and then we wrap up a few questions and try to save some time and ask at the end. So now is, we can um, hear from the open science perspective from Africa. And I will uh, invite Dr. Chamo Motsegwa to present straight away. Thank you very much. Again, even for your case, I don't know if you are the only one, but overall is not more than eight minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much, colleagues. I I don't know if Adrian managed to uh, to come through. If not, I'll be inheriting his eight minutes. Um, so it's, be having a... <laughs> it's, eight, it's eight minutes overall, yeah? For, for the both of us, eh? For the both of you, yeah. It's fine. In fact, I think Christos has done a fantastic work. Uh, besides, um, and I think I'll just skip through some of the background slides. But I really I wanted to come in today to share with you what we're trying to do in the continent to develop a Pan-African platform uh, to really help us drive the open science agenda. And I think that's a very good synergy uh, with some of the presentations here, indeed with the, with the, with the thinking around the AU Africa uh, uh, Innovation Initiative. Uh, really, I just want to give you a background. I think it's critical that Africa has got Agenda 2063 that sees Africa uh, as an integrated, prosperous continent amidst all the challenges. And it's very, very critical that uh, those two instruments that I put at the bottom there are now being revised or developed. STISA has been revised, uh, STISA 2024, so hopefully uh, open science uh, it will be infused in there. And then there's the new AU data policy framework that also has got very good recommendations, including the free flow of data uh, in the continent, especially for promoting and, and, sub and supporting digital transformation. And in the end, it's also about continental free trade agreements. So really, it's very critical that science and technology are seen as a conduit uh, for advancing continental uh, objectives. Colleagues, there are the global realities in terms of uh, the challenges that we know about, the list of which is things like climate change, food security, health for Africa. And amidst all this, the very disruptive technology that Africa also has to keep up with. And indeed, the ISC has developed a report that talks of how we need to really look at mission-oriented science. Uh, open science has been introduced. I just want to emphasize, this is all about putting society at the core and us thinking about how we can co-design uh, activities for science and research um, within the uh, prism of working with society. And of course, all that is needed to do great things like the possibility that Costas has talked about. I think it's very, very critical also the access to scientific literature in terms of where we are as a continent. I think colleagues have mentioned uh, some of these issues, issues around access to vaccines and interventions uh, that are critical. And I think an intervention like yours, AU Africa Innovation, initiative has got a very, very good chance, I would argue, uh, for redressing some of these challenges. The same goes for research happening in the continent, um, data collected on the continent, um, stored elsewhere, knowledge generated elsewhere, and incidentally, publications not reflecting the actual work done in the continent. I think these are key issues uh, that we need to think about uh, going forward. The value proposition for open science is very clear. I don't want to re-articulate it, and I think it's very, very critical that the business models, the value propositions of why we need to do open science have to be handy and communicated across stakeholders to showcase what needs to be done. Africa itself recognizes the need to action and operationalize the UNESCO Open Science recommendations. Indeed, at the recent Africa Regional Forum Sustainability Goals, uh, there was a pronouncement as part of the key messages uh, that we need as a continent to operationalize this framework and also take into cognizance those pertinent issues 
that are relevant to Africa. People have mentioned indigenous knowledge. Indeed, the UNESCO recommendations talk to dialogue with other knowledge systems. A study was done to showcase what the barriers are for open science, and you will see there there are various areas. One would argue that um, issues of culture that were mentioned are very critical. Issues of infrastructure are critical. Issues of policy, the overarching policy to support all these are also very critical. Which is why we are in the process of setting up a Pan African platform to try to redress uh, these issues we are talking about. In particular, to try to operationalize these recommendations, looking at the various areas that are highlighted there. The issue of um, infrastructure across the continent, those cloud platforms that allows us to work together uh, uh, across across the continent, or regional projects, continental projects, global challenges is quite important. The issue of skills around data intensive science, the issue of having a data institute, an AI institute permitting across our institutions in the continent is very, very critical. The issue of having those dialogue platforms to engage in open science uh, with societal actors and the, others and the like is quite critical. Um, briefly, I want to position ASP as a open science diplomacy platform, really for making sure that we can stimulate inter interactivity, but also harness the very good work that is happening in pockets in the continent to be able to amplify impact and most importantly to be able to share capacities and have a community of purpose and voice in the in the in the in the dispensation uh, in the world. I think it's very important when you operationalize ASP to look at the diversity of the continent. Our operational model will have will have the number of uh, regional nodes. We've established three so far, one in North Africa, one in East Africa and Southern Africa, and looking to have West Africa and Central Africa uh, covered in the, in the foreseeable future. ASP operates uh, in, in the context of the regional uh, policy frameworks uh, to knit things together in terms of making sure that open science uh, connects the dots between different sectors. Colleagues, I want to emphasize the need for collaborative projects that we in the African continent, in terms of our institutions that have got capacity to be able to pull our horses together and attack some of these challenges that can then become uh, obviously uh, impactful across the continent. There are some opportunities uh, through limited funding by donors. And indeed, there's a very big call uh, regarding uh, climate change and epidemiology and public health. That will require not just the science, but the engagement of policymakers and public health officials. It's also critical for African governments uh, to come to the party in terms of investment in research and facilitations of this type of work happening. Areas like genomics are exciting potential, especially given the work that has already been done in the continent, in the genetic diversity in the continent and the potential for those therapeutics that are targeted uh, to individuals. Indeed, there's a very exciting project happening as we speak that is looking to develop an open data science platform uh, in the continent for this community. The space sciences provides another very good opportunity. I'm glad the AU is also engaging in this initiative because the AU has got an AU strategy for space sciences. We've got uh, AU space agencies dotted across the continent. A lot of countries are developing space policies and space strategies. This is an opportunity to use space sciences as a conduit uh, for promoting open science. We need to make sure that we develop these infrastructures in our countries, in our continent, to make sure that we can actually then obviously amplify the connectivity in terms of collaborations in the continent. Those are the two graphs. One shows the connectivity in terms of collaboration in Europe, and you can see how in Africa is quite sparse. But in terms of having research, this research cyber infrastructures, we will be able to uh, change the status quo. Mm -hmm. Finally, we want to make sure that we can plug into the global commons of research with all that it entails. We were in Bormann and Czech Republic last year, uh, where there was a very good declaration on the fostering of global ecosystem of research infrastructure. I think this is very critical because you allow those that do have infrastructure uh, to allow those that don't to be able to for us to work together in, in areas like climate change and others. Uh, finally, maybe the slide for this particular forum, the issue of IP and open science was eloquently addressed by Costas. And I think it's critical also when you look at Africa to realize that with open science, we are still operating within the status quo uh, in terms of the national legislation that are available. Everything that we do in open science is under the umbrella of those legislations. And indeed, one can argue that some of those legislations need revamping. Uh, to make sure that they are relevant uh, regarding the open agenda and indeed going forward i think some discussions are happening in terms of their revisions colleagues 
areas like uh, indigenous knowledge are sensitive and important to Africa. It's very, very critical that these initiatives address those. There's no shortage of use cases and case studies where Africans feel shortchanged in terms of the global landscape of IPR framework. I'm giving you some examples there, including uh, an example of a initiative uh, where a system um, emanating from an African continent regarding conflict resolution has been repurposed and trademarked as a European company and providing uh, a value addition for corporate uh, trading. These are cases that uh, do not build trust in terms of the international order of things. Governments have got a very good opportunity here to skew the uh, landscape in terms of making pronouncement of what should happen to public funded research. And indeed, I'm giving an example there of what's happening with the OSTP guidelines in the US. And hopefully, going forward, there will be uh, similar initiatives, uh, similar pronouncements coming from other countries. Open innovation provides an opportunity. There's need for very good, robust, reflective IPR frameworks for open innovation. But I'll stop there. Thank you very much uh, for having us in your forum. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much to you, Chamo and Costa. I'm, I'm afraid we have to move to the next speaker, so we'll pass it to Professor Mumba because we are running out of time. That was an extremely interesting topic, and we'll see if we can have uh, maybe one question at the end of this session. So please, Professor Mumba, it's up to you to introduce the last speaker. Thank you very much again. Yeah. Yes, I was uh, inviting our last speaker, Ms. Ngombo Nancy, to make a presentation. First, you can introduce yourself. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Mumba. Thank you very much, the organizers of the meeting, for inviting the AUDA NEPAT and the presentation on the African Medicines Agency. So, as a, as background, I'll just be taking you through where we're coming from with the African Union on the African Medicines Agency. So, in 2005, there was a decision, an African Union decision. 55 to develop the pharmaceutical manufacturing plan for Africa within the NEPAD framework. So in this, uh, then in 2009, we had the initi initiative that was established called the African Medicines Regulatory Harmonization Initiative. And this is now the foundation for the African Medicines Agency. But in 2012, there was also the development of the business plan for the pharmaceutical uh, manufacturing plan for Africa with the aim to encourage local manufacturing. So the African Medicines Regulatory Harmonization Initiative was established to actually enable the regulatory uh, framework on local manufacturing. And I see the topic today is about intellectual property. So the African Medicines Agency is also going to be supporting the uh, local manufacturers of medical product regulation and issues of uh, intellectual property. So this is the vision for the African Union, which is towards uh, bringing in the 55 countries in Africa through the regional economic communities, eight of them, to now form the African Medicines Agency as one continental agency to support in regulation of priority product. My screen is so the vision was actually to use the 55 uh, national medicine regulatory authorities on the continent who had uh, a regulatory capacity. Their regulatory capacities were highly variable and also they have different requirements and formats and clear guidelines on uh, medicine regulation with minimal transparency and no clear timelines also using different uh, uh, references for evaluation. So the idea of the African Medicines uh, Regulatory Harmonization Initiative was basically to bring these countries to be able to leverage on the harmonization platform through the regional uh, economic communities. So through this regional economic communities, the aim is actually to strengthen and build the institutional capacity on regulatory uh, harmonization and also strengthen the regulatory systems in the African member states. And this is done through a single set of requirements, clear guidelines and fewer uh, dossiers for manufacturers to, to actually use when they are applying for approval of, uh, of their product into the market. And also the aim is actually to have transparent 
regulatory processes with clear timelines on uh, registering uh, products in the market. So the idea is to bring the regulators together and through resource, resource pooling, they can be able to share information. And the aim is to actually have a faster registration for medical products. So the Africa Medicines Regulation Harmonization Initiative actually has uh, had its various uh, success uh, one of which is the Africa Medicines um, uh, Agency, which the treaty was adopted in 2019 during the African Union Summit. So that's one of the achievements. I'm not going to go through because of time. So I just want to focus on one of the achievements of the regulatory harmonization initiative. So the Africa Medicines um, uh, Agency actually has a couple of, of, of functions, which I think I'm also not going to, to go through, but one of them is that it is going to lead, that's the last bullet here, is going to lead to removal of unnecessary technical barriers to trade in pharmaceuticals in support of the African continental free trade area. So I think this also speaks to the subject of discussion in this webinar. In, in the next one is, just to give a background on when the treaty was adopted in 2019. And then in 2021, the treaty came into force. That's the African Medicines Agency Treaty came into force. And at the moment, we have 26 countries that have ratified the treaty. And the main objective of, of this is to enhance capacity of the state parties and also the regional economic communities to regulate medical products in order to improve access to quality, safe, and efficacious medical products on the continent. So that's the functions of the African Medicines Agency. I think we'll share the slides so we can always look at them uh, detailedly. But I want to go directly to the organs of the African Medicines Agency. So we are going to have the conference of the state parties. These are the ministers that have ratified the treaty in the various countries. It's also going to have a governing board a secretariat and also the technical committees. But here I want to highlight the support of the African Medicines Regulatory Harmonization Initiative towards the operationalization of the African Medicines Agency. So the AUDA NEPAD is actually providing technical support. So the technical support provided by the African uh, Medicines Regulatory Harmonization Initiative towards the operationalization of AMA is through the 10 technical committees that are highlighted on, on this slide. So each of these committees are expected to actually work on the various regulatory functions so as to be able to, to support the operationalization of AMA. So we have technical committees on regulatory capacity development, good manufacturing practice. <coughs> so this will be based more on the, the manufacturers and the good manufacturing practices. So we have technical committees who oversee this, and then also technical committees on evaluating uh, the, the product itself and the assessments. <coughs> so also they have developed the regional centers of regulatory excellence. 11 of them have been developed also to enhance the work of the African Medicines Agency. And recently, uh, we had the, the establishment of regulatory centers of excellence on vaccines, regulatory oversight. And this is very key for the continent because we have the, the vision that there should be local manufacturing of vaccines on the continent. So the centers have actually been, four uh, centers have actually been established to support the regulatory oversight on vaccines manufacturing. So I think I'm going to and here, but just to highlight that the African Medicines Agency will not replace our regional economic communities or the work of our nat national regulatory authorities. We we'll basically fo focus on priority products and also products that are manufactured locally and products that have uh, complex molecules. So it's not going to replace the work of our national regulatory authorities. So I think I thank you for this time.